And this will be our last, our final um, message on the battle with temptation and sin. And so we have spent uh, two Wednesday nights dealing with the spiritual warfare. And uh, I'm probably not as good a Christian as you folks are. And uh, I, I, I battle a lot. And I started battling when I was very young. I got saved at the age of five. And at the age of six, or shortly after I got saved, a friend of mine introduced me uh, uh, to a sin that, that became uh, an addiction in my life. You know, all sin is addictive. You know, lying's addictive. You know, we like to point out, we like to look at the whoremonger and this, you know, the drunkard and the drug addict, and we like to do that. But truth of the matter is, is that all of us have a sin problem. Amen? All of us were born sinners. We were conceived sinners. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. He didn't mean his mother and dad were committing adultery. He meant that at conception, he was already a sinner, sin nature. I said earlier that uh, if, it's, if it's natural, you don't have to teach it. And if you have to teach it, it's unnatural. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach a child to hit. You don't have to teach a child to, to be disobedient. You have to, you have to teach them the opposite of that. And that's the sin nature. We all have it. Amen. In Galatians chapter 5, look with me at verse number 16. And did you get this turned on, Wes? Verse number 16, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now remember that we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. And so it's God's words, not the Apostle Paul's words, though it's in the personal, uh, personal pronouns of Paul, I beseech you, I, then I say. But we know it's inspired by God. And God wanted to send us a message, amen? And that message is, is that we should walk in the Spirit so we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that lust of the flesh is an interesting term that we need to pay attention to. The little word lust is a word that is in the Bible, and it's a, it's a word that we all should be familiar with because we all have it. Lust means to desire after something, to have a strong desire. And wicked lust means to lust after something that is inappropriate to lust after. Amen? It's inappropriate for me to lust after liquor. It's inappropriate for me to lust after uh, a woman who's not my wife. It's, it's in, inappropriate for me to lust after deception, lying. Uh, we all have a sin problem. We all have things in our life that are not pleasing to the Lord, uh, desires that are not pleasing. These are lusts. I was thinking as I was studying and just praying a little bit today, uh, there's a lot of us that we don't think we're very sinful because we don't smoke, drink, cuss, and chew and go with girls that do. But some of us, some of us in the church's problem is we have a desire to tail bear. Amen. I just want to share something with you. Yeah, you're a gossip. Amen. And that's a sin too. You know, we like to we like to think we're pretty good, uh, and and that I don't really need this kind of a teaching because look at me. I don't I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't cuss. I don't chew. Yeah, but you're tempted to lie. You're tempted to tail bear. You're tempted to be critical of other people. You're te tempted to judge. Judge not lest you be judged. I, there, there, is, there is this matter of, of righteous judgment, but most of us are judgmental. Amen? We look at somebody, and the reason we judge people is because it makes us feel superior. Well, I'm not like so-and-so. Well, I'm glad I'm not like you. If that's what you think is spiritual, that you look down your nose at everybody else, amen? And so uh, we all have a battle, don't we? And it says here in verse 17, look at it, For the flesh, that which we were born with, the sin nature, lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, not, God is not giving us a license to sin here. He's just telling us why it is that you and I can't do perfect. If you're truly saved, you want to do perfect. 
If you got Jesus in your heart and you really love God, there's a desire in your heart to never sin. Amen. And we, we mentioned in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 that we know we're not supposed to sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And so we know as Christians that we're truly saved. I don't want to sin. I don't want to have these evil thoughts. I don't want to desire this stuff. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to have that attitude. Can I tell you that uh, normally when you get saved, God will deal with what I, can, I call the external sins, the things that people can see, like cussing or smoking or drinking or drug addiction or fornication or pornography, these types of things. God will deal with those. And then when he gets done with that, he says, now let's get down to the real stuff. Let's talk about your attitude. Let's talk about your, 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 your priorities. You see, if you put your wife above God, you've sinned. He that loveth father more than, more than me is not worthy of me. If you, if you idolize your children and place them above God, you've sinned. If, you're, if your life is being lived for the money you can make and the possessions you can get, you're living a sinful life. Because you're supposed to be living for the glory of God and the furtherance of His kingdom. And it's, it's, you should work and you should labor, but that shouldn't be your goal. Amen? And so uh, I think that most of what I consider good Christians, if you could see their minds and hearts, you wouldn't be too impressed. Amen? You wouldn't be too impressed about what those things that run through. You know, and I, I wish the mind, I tell you, the mind is a crazy thing. I wish I could get my mind to slow down sometimes. I wish I could get my mind to shut off sometimes. And uh, Dr. Tom Malone said one time, he said, when I'm preaching, thoughts go through my head like a covey of quail. And I, and I agree with that. I mean, you'll be walking down through the day, and your mind is just racing, and it's taking you places where you don't want to go. Say, what in the world? Why did I think that? Why is that going on in my heart and my mind? And so we're in a battle. We're in a battle. It's a battle with temptation and sin. As we've said, it, it, it's, a, it's a fact of life. And we said also that we need to understand that it is not a sin to be tempted. And many Christians are defeated because they have a sin nature and they think this sin nature makes them a bad person. Well, we are bad people, but when you're saved, that sin nature does not make you bad because you're tempted. You're not bad because you're tempted. We're tempted because we have a sin nature and we can be tempted, but because we're tempted doesn't mean we're sinful. Amen? And we talked about that. Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. It only becomes sin when you act upon the temptation. James chapter 1 says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. It's the conception of it. It's the moment that the act takes place. So if I'm walking down the street uh, this, the, today and I see, I see something that somebody has and it's out there where I can steal it and the thought goes through my head, hey, I, I want that, I'm going to take it. Well, I know that's wrong, right? And it's a sin. Uh, but that temptation is there. And it's not sin because I'm tempted. I'm sin. Be, I'd sin when I go and take it. The act of stealing it is the sin. The act of, 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 of actually uh, fornicating would be the sin. Amen? Now, I want to tell you this. You want to try to reduce temptation in your life. Uh, that's one of the things you want to do. You want to try to reduce temptation. How do you do that? Well, I'll give you some tools tonight to try to help you reduce temptation. Uh, one of the things you need to do is you need to stay away from places where temptation is. You know, it's pretty simple. If temptation's on the TV, shut the TV off. I got rid of TV in my life because the stuff on TV was causing me to think things I shouldn't be thinking. And it doesn't bother you that way, that's fine. But it did me, so I recognized the temptation, said i got to get this out of my life. You know, if, uh, if going to a certain place, uh, you know, I, I love sports, but sports was my God. And so I had to pull clear out of sports. I turned football clear off. And for 25 years, I never watched a football game. Why? Because it was a God in my life. It took my time. It controlled me. It took control of me. I couldn't control myself. You know, and some people are TV addicts. Turn the TV on, it controls you, and you don't control yourself. How you know, Brother Houston? Because you sit there for three hours and don't even know you wasted three hours. It's controlling you. Amen. And so there's lots of things. And I don't know what your area of battle is. Maybe it's jealousy, you know. 
Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people don't like the way they look, so they're jealous of somebody they think looks better. A lot of people are covetous. They don't like the things they have. You know, I don't have as nice a house as she has. I don't have as nice a car as they have. I don't have this. Those are all sins, amen? And uh, we want to make, make it like, well, they're not as bad as these other sins. I want to say something to you. I, I do believe there are some sins that are extremely, extremely disgusting in God's mind. I, I think homosexuality is one of those. I think pedophilia is one of those. I think they're very disgusting in God's mind. But God doesn't, God doesn't say that he, he condones those other sins uh, less, uh, um, less than he condones those sins. Amen? Sin is sin with God. Amen? All liars shall have their part laid in front of them. The unbelieving and the fearful are going to go to hell. Those aren't real bad sins, are they? Unbelieving? In our minds, those aren't real bad sins, are they? Fearful? Uh, whoremongers, idolaters, sorcerers, murderers, yeah, those ought to go to hell. And all liars, amen. So God says, look, you don't understand there. I do not like any sin in your life. I want you to be holy like I'm holy. I want you to be perfect. Well, we're not. And here's the reason why, because of this battle. And so it, 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 um, what I'm going to say, what I said there was, it's not a sin to be tempted. All of us as Christians, are, none of us are exempt from this battle. The battle with temptation and sin. We said last week uh, the failure to, to, bring the, the, to, to win this battle has some consequences. Number one, there's reaping what you sow. Galatians 6, 7, 8. Be not seed. God is not mocked what for men soweth. That's one of the consequences. You know, you can't go out and rob a liquor store and then expect God to let you get by with the consequences. Any more than you can lie and expect God to let you get by without some consequences. Once you say something about reaping what you sow, you don't, you, you don't, always, you don't always reap on the same day you sow. But it's going to catch up with you, amen? It's going to be a day when you look back and say, yeah, I'm paying for that. You, you, you reap more than you sow. My dad, my grandfather was a farmer. He put one corn of wheat in the ground. He got back a whole head full. David committed sin with Bathsheba. He paid fourfold. That's the law of reaping and sowing. You reap in like kind. David committed adultery, and his son Amnon raped his sister, and, and Absalom went in to David's concubines. Abraham lied about Sarah, and, and, uh, and, 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 and Isaac lied about Rebekah. Those things happen. So he's reaping. There's reaping. If the only thing that reaping is is the memory, that's enough. That's enough torment. That's enough paying. I'm 61 years old, and I still am reaping the memory of decisions I made. I will never stop reaping those until I die. Pretty high price to pay for a little bit of fun, to have to continue to live with it. In many cases in some people's lives, they, they, they have a physical reminder every day of their life of something they did, and God wants you to have victory over that, but that's a part of the reaping what you sow. And then there's God's chastisement. Amen? God's chastisement. That's a consequence of, of, of not winning the battle. You know, I can go out here tonight, right now. I can go out here and get, get a, a fifth of whiskey and get drunk. I can go over and rob a, rob a store somewhere. I can go find some woman and commit adultery. Uh, but you know what? Uh, the, the consequence is that God's going to chasten me. I'm not going to get by with it. It's not going to get by with it. You know, well, what if you don't get caught by the law? That doesn't mean God hadn't caught you. I mean, God isn't chastening you. I really believe God's greatest chastening tool is guilt. How many of you like to feel guilty? How many of you like to have peace and happiness in your life and contentment and joy? How many of you like your mind and your heart troubled? And that's what sin does to you, man. And one of the greatest things that sin does is robs you of your joy. When David committed that sin with Bathsheba, he prayed and asked God, he said, I've sinned against you. He said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and heal the bones which thou hast broken. I don't think God lifted him down and broke his bones. David was so miserable in his whole body. His, his bones ached and his heart was broken and his joy was gone. And he said, God, forgive me. I want my joy back. Amen. The greatest thing that sin does in our life, it robs us of our joy and then it ruins our testimony. What will David go down as? You mentioned David, it's almost always Bathsheba. You mentioned Samson, it's almost always Delilah. 
All this good that they did is usually not remembered because they ruined their testimony. I know some great men of God who, were, who did great works and then they messed up. And nobody remembers the great work. All they do remember is their mess up. You know, when David, when Cain killed his brother Abel, God said he, he, said he put a mark on him. Now, I don't know what that mark is, but here's what I thought one day, and, I, I, and I, I, I think God gave it to me, and I preached it to our young people at our Christian school. You know what the mark was? Did you know that everybody living on the face of planet Earth at that time was Cain's relative? You know what he went through life being? The murderer. He had a big old bullseye on him, and everybody was shooting at him. There's that murderer. There's that murderer. There's that murderer. Well, I tell you what, I wish I could go back and redo some things I did in Haven, Kansas. Because when I walk in Haven, Kansas, sometimes people talk about things I don't want them to talk about. Ruin my testimony. Ruin my testimony. Serious thing. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And then it causes doubt. We said that first John 2, 3, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If you're not living right, it causes you to doubt, doesn't it? How can I be a Christian and have these thoughts? How can I be a Christian and do these things? And that's why we have to understand the battle. And then it can cause you loss of your life. You know, the Bible talks about the sin unto death. And you know, uh, God is a long-suffering, merciful God. And, and most of us wouldn't even believe there's such a thing as a sin unto death. But God says there is. And as a pastor, I, I, I buried two of my young Christian school students before they were in their, before they out, got out of their 30s. And one of, them, one of them I didn't talk to, but his dad talked to him, and it, God was doing something. But one of them came to church two weeks before he died, came up and said, Preacher, I, I've been away. I know when you get back, told his mom, if I don't get back, if I don't get back right with God, something's going to happen to me. He didn't come back the next Sunday, and that week he was killed head on, and a car wreck, a, a semi hit him. Him and his girlfriend, they went out into eternity. God says, look, I'm a patient, loving God. I've chastened you. I've chastened you. I've chastened you. I talked about last week how you start gently, and then you have to slap harder, and then you have to increase the punishment. And hopefully as you increase the punishment, the desire for the disobedience becomes less. And pretty soon you quit because you say, I, I don't enjoy doing this anymore. But if you don't quit and you step over the line, God says, that's it. He that being often reproved, the Bible says, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. What you do, God? Okay. Time to come home. And we'll cut it short. So we need to get the we need to get the victory. Well, the battle makes us feel wretched. We talked about that. And I said last week there's victory in Jesus. Without Jesus, there's no victory. Without you, you can do nothing. Paul said, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. You're not going to win the victory if you're not a Christian. Amen? Now, you can go to some health, self-help programs, and everybody's got some morality that they can place in their life. And some people, you know, there's a conscience of God written on our heart. And some, some lost people are better than some saved people. And that's kind of a quandary to us. How can they be better than we are? But the truth of the matter is, is people are different. Everybody's different. But I want to tell you, if they, they're better than you are, doesn't mean they're good. Amen? They're still sinners, and they're on their way to hell, and they still need Jesus, and they still have their problems. Amen? But we as Christians, I want to say this. I don't believe the world gets attacked like Christians do. And I don't believe that Christians who are worldly get attacked like Christians who are spiritual do. When I, was, when I was not living for the Lord, the devil didn't bother me. I mean, he, he was tempting me and he was having his way with me. But as soon as I got broken and got right with God, then the devil came after me with both barrels, I mean. I mean, he just came after me, amen. And a lot of Christians don't even, I didn't even, I knew there was a devil, but I didn't know too much about him until I tried to start serving the Lord, and then he came after me, amen. And if you're just starting to serve the Lord, don't be surprised the devil comes after you, amen, because he didn't have to come after you when you weren't living for the Lord. He already had you, amen. You're already doing what he wants you to do. Now you've stepped up and said, I'm going to serve the Lord. Look out, brother. It's coming. Amen. He's going to come after you with everything he can. With me, he just came after me with doubt. 
He just, he, just, he just pounded me with doubt, doubt about my salvation, and just pounded me. And he, and he brought my past up, and I spent all my time looking at my past and saying, you know, if I, am I truly saved? Because if I'm saved, why did I do that? And I, I mean, I spent miserable years, miserable years fighting that battle with Satan who was planting doubt in my mind. He, and God's not a planter of doubt. God's a planter of, uh, of, of security and positive. And, you know, in the Bible, there's only one time I see in the Bible Maybe a couple times, but Paul said one time, examine yourself. The rest of his message is you're saved. Amen? Amen. And uh, I, so we don't, we're not trying to preach doubt here, amen, but that's what sin will do, and that's what the devil will do in your life. Well, we said that we, we need to win this battle, and uh, the reason the devil can tempt us is because we have an evil heart. We were shaping in iniquity, amen? Every man is drawn away of his own lust. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, you might want to write that down. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I was reading that verse one day, and it's like the Lord said to me, look at that. The heart is deceitful above what? All things. He says, he says and I think he said to me, and I'm not making this a doctrine, I think he said to me, that means more deceitful than the devil. It's deceitful above all things. Is the devil a thing or an object? I don't know. But the thought came to me, the devil couldn't tempt us with what he does if we weren't so wicked. I mean, my heart is deceitful. Probably more deceitful than the devil. I don't know. That's just a thought. That's not a doctrine there. But, but, but that's why it's so easy, because our heart's deceitful and desperately wicked. Not just wicked, desperately wicked, like a desperado and deceitful. What does that mean? It's a master at deceiving us. Explain, you know, well, it, it's not wrong. Well, who said that? The devil? You know, has God said? Well, God didn't mean. And your heart, your heart, the Bible says, accuses or else excuses you, your conscience. And we're in this battle. And uh, you know, part of us saying, the Holy Spirit saying, that's wrong. And the heart's over there saying, no, ain't nothing wrong with it. I mean, look, this is okay, and this is okay, and you're not really doing this, and you're not really doing that, and you're not really going to. Anybody been there? Or I'm the only one, probably. I can say I'm, I'm probably the worst Christian in here. Well, the devil always tempts us in three areas. Go to 1 John chapter 2. I want to finish up. 1 John chapter 2, the devil can only tempt us in three areas. He always tempts us in three areas. If you learn these three areas when you're, following, when you're in temptation, you can identify which type of attack the devil is giving you. In 1 John 2, 15, it says, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now look at verse 16. For all that is in the world, now here's the three areas, the lust of the flesh. I want to write that down, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eyes. And number three, the pride of life. This is all that is in the world. This is the three areas where the devil can tempt you. What's the lust of the flesh? That's anything that brings you fleshly pleasure. Okay? Or brings you some type of an emotional pleasure. You know, that's, that's uh, gluttony. You know, that's drinking alcoholism till you're drunk. I mean, that's, that's smoking dope. That's sexual sins. The physical, the physical pleasure of that. Yeah, and I, I want to say this. I said this all the time to my church. You know, there, there's pleasure in sin or we wouldn't do it. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. And while you're sinning, the pleasure is so great, you don't consider the consequences. While you're sinning even, many times you have totally shut down the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And so while you're sinning, there's nothing spiritual going on in your life. You're acting just like a lost person. Amen? And you're being totally, you're to totally, being totally unregenerate. And really, God's not having any work in your life because you're not walking in the Spirit. You're walking in the flesh. And we can flip into the flesh and into the Spirit and into the flesh and into the Spirit just like that. Just like that. It's amazing. Amen? And I, I hope that you understand what I'm saying. So the lust of the flesh, physical, the lust of the eyes is any type of desire that comes by looking at something. This would then involve mostly things like covetousness, jealousy, which leads you to steal or leads you to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to belittle somebody, 
uh, or something because, uh, uh, or, or those types of things. And then the last one is the pride of life. And what is the pride of life? The pride of life is anything that tempts you to exalt yourself. We lie a lot because we don't want people to really know what we are. Well, you ever had people ask some questions and the truth of the matter is you didn't want to tell them the truth? Sure, we've all been there. And so what do you do? Tell a lie? What is that? Pride of life. I don't want them to think bad of me. You know, I don't think we ought to have to answer everybody's questions. Amen. Now, I think the best way to handle it is say, well, I'm just not answering that question. It's really not your business. Kindly. When I pastor a church, you know, I, uh, pastors know things that they aren't supposed to share with people. And, and you got people in church who want to know everything. I had one guy in my church who want to know everything. And we come to you and say, Brother Houston, what about so and so? This is how I'd answer him. Let's look at him. He said, I guess I don't need to know that. That's right. If you need to know, I'll tell you. You know, they have that in, uh, in a lot of places, need to know, right? If you don't need to know, then you don't need to know. Amen. But, you know, uh, but I've had people ask me questions, and truth of the matter is, man, God, I don't want to tell the truth. So I'm being tempted to lie, aren't I? Well, if I follow that and tell a lie, now I may walk away and feel justified because I felt like they asked me a question they shouldn't ask me, but I've ended up lying, and I'm guilty. Amen. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of things we do in our life that we don't even consider wrong. And I believe that we need to live our life understanding this battle, understanding right and wrong, understanding how the devil uses this, and then making the right decisions. Amen? Amen. I believe that. Well, the devil tempted Jesus that way. Jesus was hungry. That's a lust of the flesh. Man, I want to, oh, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. So make this, make this stone into bread. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You said, wouldn't be sin for Jesus to turn stone into bread, would it? But the sin would have been listening to the devil. Amen? Letting the devil tempt him to do it. The sin would have been letting his flesh, his hunger, push him to the point of doing something that he shouldn't have done. I don't know if you've ever been so hungry, you've done some things you shouldn't have done, but I've been so hungry, I've done some things I shouldn't have done. I mean, man, I could eat a horse. I'm hungry. And then he tempted him with the lust of the eyes. He took him up on a mountain and said, look, everything out here, you can have it all. You'll just bow down and worship me. That's what the devil does to us when he, when he waves those things of the world in front of us. He said, look, the only thing it will cost you is missing church. Only thing it'll cost you is, uh, is, 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 is maybe you need to drop a little bit of your convictions. Man, if you, if you just wouldn't be such a fanatic for Jesus and didn't have such convictions, you know, if, if you didn't mind just breaking that a little bit. I mean, I remember that my, my cousin's husband was in the military and, uh, and he, he rose in the ranks pretty good and so he had to go to all these military balls. And all these military balls, there's dancing and drinking. I remember my cousin saying how that she detested having to go to those places because it's like they're trying to force you to drink. I mean, if you're the kind of Christian I think you ought to be, you're not drinking that stuff. Now I'm a teetotaler. I mean, I don't sip it. Look not on the wine when it's red, when it moveth itself aright in the glass. Don't look at it when it's effervescent, when it's fermented and bubbling. Don't look at it. A teetotaler. Amen. And so I, 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 I but, 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 but that's what the lust of the eyes is. You know, what will you do to get a new car? Rob the tithes and offerings? All that falls under the lust of the eyes. Pride of life. You know, bragging on yourself. You know? Telling a story of, I played college football. You know, I ran for 7,000 yards and 2,600 touchdowns. And I was all American. And find out the guy didn't even put a, uh, didn't even put a uniform on. I was at a, 
quote unquote Christian camp with some athletes when I was a public high school coach. And this guy was bragging about how he played football at WSU and how that, that when they had that plane crash that went down, killed the football team, he was injured so he didn't get to fly. And after we were there that week under the preaching, he came to me one day. He said, I need to tell you, talk to you. I need to ask you to forgive me. He said, I was all a pack of lies. Everything I said was a pack of lies. You know, we were at an athlete's camp, a fellowship of Christian athletes camp. He wanted to look like a big shot. So he lied about it. That's the temptation. The devil said to Jesus, look, you're God. Why don't you prove it to everybody? Jump off of here. And God will keep you from going, uh, from, from smashing down there, and it'll prove to everybody, Jesus, exalt yourself. Amen. And so that's the areas that the devil tempts us. Now, the devil cannot and does not make any of us do anything. Amen. You need to understand that. The truth of the matter is the devil can only tempt us. The flesh can only draw us with its lust. But the bottom line is, is that the person who makes us do it is ourself. If I lie, I did it because I chose to. If I steal, I did it because I decided to give in to the temptation and do what my passions were saying. If I would go out here and, and, and commit f uh, adultery with some woman, it would, it would only be my fault. It wouldn't be my wife's fault. It wouldn't be God's fault. It wouldn't be the church's fault. It wouldn't be anybody's fault. I can't blame it on pornography or television or anything else. Those may all be tempting factors, but the truth of the matter is I ultimately make the decision. And if you make the, God cannot hold you accountable if you don't have the, 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 the authority. So God could be wrong to say to me, Ted, I'm going to hold you accountable when you don't have the decision-making power. So if somebody else has the power to make that decision, then I'm not accountable. But I'm accountable for all my actions. I'm accountable for all my words. I'm accountable for all my thoughts. Amen. And God's going to judge us for all of that. The Bible says that every idle word we speak, the Bible says every action we do. Now, I'm not trying to be mean or scare you anything. I'm just trying to tell you what the, where, where it is. And the Bible says God even tries the thoughts. And he's got a book written down with all of our deeds in it. And he says, I'm going to have you give an account to me. And I'm glad it's an account to my Savior and not an account to my, uh, to my enemy. Amen. And what I'm going to have to do is go, I'm going to have to give an, give an answer. I did this. I'm guilty, 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 guilty. Thank God for your mercy. I think that's one of the reasons we'll fall down at his feet and worship him because we will find out, we will feel, we will find out how filthy and wretched we were and we will finally understand how merciful and gracious he was. Amen. And we'll fall at his feet and praise him. And thou art worthy, O oh Lord, to receive glory and honor. And, and, and then he's going to wipe away every tear from our eye amen and i believe he can't do that unless he wipes the memory clean amen and, and then we'll go into eternity we'll never have another another moment a twinge of guilt or anything amen and that's going to be a wonderful thing and you know some people say well i don't like that part of christianity well, there's a lot of parts of christianity i don't like but that doesn't make christianity bad it doesn't make christianity not true amen and a lot of people say well if i don't like something it's not true well you know get over it there's a lot of things i don't like that are true I don't like the administration we have, but it's true. Amen. I don't like, the, I don't like what the Supreme Court did with same-sex marriage, but it's true. It happened. Okay? And so uh, I think a lot of people, we, we get hung up. Well, how do we win the battle? So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we looked at it last week very quickly. Turn there, and I'll get done here very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to give you some very practical things now. Maybe you write down these uh, points and write down the verses and go home study them. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, write down this statement, mental gymnastics. Mental gymnastics. I use this term because here's what the Bible is teaching us here. You and I need to flip our thought processes. It's like I'm going along here and my mind is going this direction and a direction I don't want to go. And I need to flip. I need to do a black back flip and I need to turn around and go the other way. And so I have to do this in my mind. This is where the battle is going on, in the mind. The devil, the devil can only plant the thought. He can't. That's what he did to Eve, right? Hey, has God said you can't touch, you can't, can't eat that? Well, God said we can't even touch it. We can't eat it. We can't even look at it. Well, she added, but 
you know, I think it's a pretty good idea not to look at it. A lot of people condemn her for that. I don't condemn her for that, but I, I see what the devil was doing. Has God said? Putting a thought in her mind. You're not going to die. He's starting to get stinking thinking, I call it. Amen. God knows the day you eat that up, you're going to be just like he is. And now her mind is being led to say, well, wow, look at that. I mean, I, maybe I won't die. And, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe God really didn't mean that. And maybe I would be good to take it. And the Bible says she's always good to look at. It was for, good for food and to make one wise. And she took it. Her mind was being tempted. She's thinking the wrong things. She needed to stop that. Jesus stopped it every time by quoting Scripture. And I'll get to that in a minute. But mental gymnastics, look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not warn the flesh. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's through God, not us, but God gave us the program. Now he says, verse 5, here it is, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every what? Thought to the obedience of Christ. Mental gymnastics. So here's what I'm saying. The thought goes through your head. Steal that. You're going to have to change that thinking. You're going to have to take that thought, and you're going to have to cast it down. And literally, I've done this physically. When I'm thinking stuff, I've grabbed like this on my head, and I've said, I am not thinking of that anymore, and I've cast it on the ground. Now, that's, that's extreme, but it helps me. You don't have to do that. But, you know, I, I'm... I, 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 I was in a, in a serious battle for my life spiritually. Serious battle. I mean, Satan was after me 24-7. I'm not, I don't know why, but he was. I told you I knelt in Walmart behind a basket and prayed. I got mad at one of my church members. He did me dirty. You know, hey, look, when, uh, preachers are human. When they get hurt, they don't walk around and say, oh, that felt good. It doesn't feel good to them. They hurt too. They're just like you are. And when they've been mistreated, they got the same thoughts going through their head you do. They're trying to be spiritual, but they're human. I mean, a guy did me dirty, dirty. I mean, really dirty. I mean, bad, dirty kind of stuff that you'd have got mad about. And, and I was wrestling. I was having malice in my heart. I wanted something to happen to the guy. I just wanted something to happen to him. God, it's not fair. He's treated me wrong. God, you ought to. I mean, I was, I was mad. I'm out here mowing the yard. I got this stuff going through. I mean, man, I'm in a fit. You ever get worked up in a, in a tizzy? I was, I was worked up, man. I mean, I guess if I'd have had something, I might beat the snot out of him if he showed up. I don't know. But I knew what was going on was wrong. So I knelt down and I said, dear God, please, I, I don't want to be thinking these things. I know they're wrong. Please help me. You know, while I was praying, that thought went away. I stood back up and I took my next step and out came that thought again. I went back down to my knees. I prayed. I got up. I took my next step and then down to and that thought came again. Uh, seven steps, seven times kneeling in the yard behind the lawnmower. I don't know if anybody, nobody saw me because we're out in the country. But if I'd have been in the neighborhood, people said, "What's wrong with that nut?" I tell you, what's wrong with me? What's another wrong with me? I wanted to have victory. Look, some of us are too embarrassed about what's going on to, 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 to maybe make some, some uh, to do some things that might seem strange to people, Just, uh, but we need to want victory enough. I remember Dr. Coleman talking about one of his deacons that came to him and said, Dr. Coleman, I, I've got a problem. I, I, I got a pornography problem. And Dr. Coleman, pastor down in Texas, said, well, brother, tell me about it. You know, he didn't criticize him, condemn him, tell him about it. He said, well, it only happens when I go to the drugstore to get my medicine. He said, when I go there, I have to walk past the magazine section, and my eyes just look over there, and I see that stuff, and I have to wait on my prescription, and so and my, it just draws me back there, and I pick it up, and I look at it. And he said, Dr. Dr. Coleman, I'm, I'm a deacon, and I'm so embarrassed. I don't know what to do. And Dr. Coleman said, uh, do you have to go get your medicine there? He said, yeah, well, that's my pharmacy. He said, do you have to go get it? Can you send somebody else? He said, well, I could send my wife. He said, well, I would suggest you send your wife. About two weeks, about a month later, he came back to Dr. Coleman. He said, Dr. Coleman, guess what? I haven't looked at a dirty picture in a month. And he put a big old grin on his face. Haven't been to the drugstore either. Well, that's a little radical, brother. What is, what is radical about wanting to live holy? 
What is radical about doing whatever it is you need to do to stay out of sin? What's radical about that? I think that's Christian. Amen. And who cares what, hey, by the way, who cares what the world cares? Who cares what Christians care, think? You know, I really don't care what Christians think if I'm trying to serve the Lord. Amen. Not trying to be uh, arrogant or anything, but I don't care. You, you don't have to agree with me. If that's what I believe God wants me to do, I'm not violating Scripture and I'm not a heretic, then I don't care if you, you know. I, Brother Houston, come over and do this. No, I'm not going. And my family are saved, but when I started trying to get right with God, there were some things I couldn't do. There were places I couldn't go, practices I couldn't participate in, people I couldn't be around, and periodicals I couldn't look at. Amen. And my family want to go do some things that didn't fit in with my, would, would cause me to be tempted to sin. I'd say to them, ah, but go ahead, I'm not going. Why not? I don't want to have a discussion about it. Well, I'm just not going. And they always offend it. Like you're trying to be a holier than thou. I'm not trying to be holier than thou. Go do whatever you want to do. But I'm not going because I'm not going to sin. Mental gymnastics. Change. Now, now, how do you do that, Brother Houston? Well, here's how I do it. Whenever I have a thought that's not there, I, I cast it down. I say, I say God, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that thought's here. I don't want to think about that. I cast it down. And then I find something else to think on. One of the things I learned was that there are certain verses in the Bible that will help you combat your sin. And I had to ask God, show me the verses I need to learn that will help me with my struggles. And I, God showed me the verses, and I learned those verses. And every time I would have that battle in my mind, I would say, I'm not going to think of that. And then I would begin to quote the Scripture over and over and over. And I couldn't think on that because I was thinking on the Word of God. Amen. Uh, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I'd be out there on that tractor, I think I mentioned last week, out there on that tractor plowing. And what a devil's play, uh, play room, amen. The idle mind is a devil's workshop. And I'm going around there plowing and plowing and plowing and plowing and plowing. And no radio, nothing. You know, my grandfather didn't believe in any of that stuff. And, uh, and the devil's starting. And, and one of the things I learned to do was sing Amazing Grace. As loud as I could, you know, I'm out of amazing grace, how sweet. I don't know what the neighbors thought, and I don't care what they thought. I just know this. The devil was trying to get in my mind. The devil was trying to mess up my life. And I'm bound, bent, and determined the devil not going to have his way in my life. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Get your mind. Hey, I'll tell you another one that, that's really good. Praying. You know, it's pretty hard to think wrong thoughts when you're praying. Amen. And so just start praying. I'll tell you another one that's real good. The Bible says that they overcame him by the word of the, the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. When the devil starts messing your mind, just give your salvation testimony. You say, you know what, old devil? <laughs> at five years of age at the Haven Baptist Church, I, the, Lord, the Lord God saved my soul, reached down and, and, and saved me and, 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 and put me in his, in his family. And, and the devil, you can get out of here. You're a liar. I'm saved. By the way, the devil flees when you start talking about the blood and about your salvation. One of the greatest tools I ever learned was to just talk about. I, I think that's why Paul gave his salvation testimony so much. I believe Paul was under attack as great Christian as he was. Like Jesus was under attack more than anybody. I believe Paul was pretty close to that. And I believe that Paul had to constantly start to remind himself, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Because that devil was after Paul. I mean, look, he had a lot to throw at him. He was a blasphemer and a murderer, injurious. And he gave his testimony. I'll tell you, these things will help you to stop thinking things you shouldn't be thinking. I call it stinking thinking, sinful thinking. It's temptation. Mental gymnastics. Let me give you the next one. Uh, uh, take your Bibles, turn to James, now chapter number uh, four. I want to give you the next one. I call it spiritual weightlifting. Spiritual weightlifting. I'm an old high school football coach, and, and uh, I, I, I put together and set up the weight room and the weight program in Osage City, Kansas. And, and uh, if you... If you went to college and you got a degree in, in, uh, in uh, physical education or coaching or, or uh, training, they don't call it weightlifting. They call it resistance training. It's an interesting thing. 
And, and here's the whole point is that weight, is, your, your job is what you're doing is you're resisting the weight. You see? So I'm lifting the weight. No, you're resisting the weight. See, the weight is a gravitational force. And it's trying to crush you. And when you're weightlifting, you're actually resisting a force that's trying to crush you. So we call it resistance training. And the Bible teaches us that, that you and I are supposed to resist the devil. Look at that, what it says there in James chapter number 4 and verse 7. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 tells us we have an, en an enemy, the roaring lion. In verse 9 it says, whom resist steadfast. And so here's one of the things you do. Anytime you see a temptation coming in your life, your job is to resist it, push against it, resist it. Now, uh, I think you understand that term, but here's what I like to teach people. The weight is not going to change. The temptation is never going to change. The devil can only tempt you in those three areas. So he's never going to change his temptation. His tactics can't. But here's what it is. So you and I, when we first start, this battle of trying to live sin, uh, sinlessly and get victory over the sin, it's so difficult. And we fail so much, we get discouraged and we quit. Because we're trying. I'm trying, Brother Houston. I'm trying to resist this sin. I'm trying to not curse. I'm trying to not covet. I'm trying to not drink or smoke. I'm trying to not take those drugs. I'm trying to keep my mind pure. But it seems like I just can't win. But the point that you're trying means that you are getting strength. Even if you're failing, if you are trying to resist, you are getting strength. So I, I real straight like this. You put 150 pounds on that barbell and you pull it off of there. Boom! It just crushes you. But you're just, you're giving every air, oh, and somebody takes it off. So you quit. You're never going to do it. But you continue to do that. It comes off, and now, oh, you held it a couple seconds. Now you've held it six seconds. Now you've held it ten seconds. Now you held it, dropped it down to your chest, and you put it up. What happened? Because you were resisting, even though you were failing, because you were resisting, you were building spiritual muscles. And you keep resisting, keep resisting pretty soon. Well, you got this temptation pretty soon. One time, you resist it and you don't do it. Woo! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. But the devil ain't through. He's coming back. But guess what? Now I've done it once. I know I can do it again. And now I can do it three and four. And I start resisting. Here's what happens. If you'll work at it long enough and keep after it, you'll get to the place where what used to be a great burden and a great enemy will become easy to resist. I mean, there are things in my life that were destroying me that I have not, and, and I'm not bragging nor challenging the devil, but at this point in my life, I have very little, if any, inkling to do them, and when they come, I can easily deal with them because I worked for years. It took me 15 years to get victory over a sin. But I said I'm not quitting. Now, I may fail, but I'm going to get up. The righteous fall seven times, riseth again. Though they shall fall, they shall not be utterly cast down. God says you're going to fall like learning to ride a bike. Get up and go again. 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 And don't ever quit. And I promise you, one day you'll look back and say, Glory to God, hallelujah, I have seen victory. Over that sin. Amen. Spiritual weightlifting. Resist. Well, let me hurry because we need to get out of here. I know it's past your bedtime, though you'll be up till 1030 watching the news. First Corinthians chapter 6. Turn over there with me. First Corinthians chapter 6. This word you want to write down is called willpower. 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 Hate to say this to him, Brother Ken, but the truth of the matter is, you're going to win this victory, they have to have willpower. Amen? Yeah, you know what? We want, a, we want a pill to fix everything, don't we? Give me some potion I can drink. Give me some pill. Now, you know what? It's about time some of us decided, I'm going to have some willpower. You know, I, I got this cancer. And they gave me a strange diet. Weird, man. I grew up in the country. Pork, 
beef, potatoes, you know, you know, uh, biscuits and gravy made with lard. I mean, everything is bad for you. Guy walks in and says, no more beef, no more pork, no more biscuits, no more gravy, nothing carbohydrate, nothing. But I got cancer. What would you do? I exercised willpower. I will do what he told me to do. I won't do what I'm not supposed to do. I told my people for 26 years, God will never slap a beer out of your hand. He'll never pull a needle out of your arm. He'll never pull you out of a bed of adultery. He'll never keep you from lying. God will never do that. He gives you the wisdom, and he gives you his strength to do it, but he's, you have to exercise your willpower. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves, mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He says, here's, what, here's the sins. Sinners can't go to heaven. He said, this is what you were, but now you're saved. Then look at verse 12. He said, all things are lawful unto me. He said, I can do exactly those same things if I want to because God gave us the right free choice. I can go get drunk if I want to. I can go commit, I can kill, I can do anything because God gave me the free choice. All things are lawful unto me. But look what the next statement he says. But all things are not expedient. They're not good for us. All things are lawful unto me. Now watch the last statement here. But, what's the next word there? I. I, I will not, I will not what? Be brought under the power of any. So I'm going to tell you something. I will not. Willpower. Willpower. I will, I won't. I will go to church. I will read my Bible. I will pray. I will give my tithes. I will give my offering. I will live righteous and holy. I will not miss church. I will not uh, go without praying. I will not go without reading my Bible. I will not drink. I will not smoke. I will not cuss. I will not commit adultery. I will not. Isn't there some pill I can take? No. How bad do you want to live righteous? It's a battle. Get in it and start fighting. Get in it and start weightlifting. Get in it and start practicing mental gymnastics. Get in it and start having some character. The Bible says that one of the fruits of the Spirit is temperance. That's self-control. That means doing character. Bill Rice says this. I like this. You might write this down or think about it. Bill Rice says character is doing right in spite of internal desire, external pressure, or eventual outcome. Think about that. It's usually what causes us to do wrong, internal desire. But I want to do wrong. External pressure. Come on, come on, man. It won't hurt anything. Or eventual outcome. You know, when you do right, it doesn't always turn out so good. Everybody doesn't love you. You don't win the lottery. You don't get to pass a, pass a jail and get $200. Amen? Amen. Choice. Choice is the next one. Choice, Romans chapter 6, says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, neither yield you your members. Choice. Can I tell you this honestly? Let me, just say, let me just put it down to you. That word right there is the whole key. Choice. Choice. There's $500 up here in the offering plate. There's not. But if somebody wants to put some in there, we'll take it. $500 cash sitting there. And I have the temptation to take it. I have a choice to make. Will I? Won't I? I need exercise willpower. But the ultimate thing that happens is it's the choice. You can have all the willpower you want, but then when you make the choice, you have sinned. You can do all the gentle gymnastics you want to, but if you finally go ahead and make the choice, you've sinned. So you've got to make the right choice. Amen. You've got to make the right choice. You have to, you have to choose right. Dr. Wa Brother Walsh used to say to the young people at Twin City, or you say, listen, 
Young people, life is based on choices. Life is based on choices. I used to make this statement too. Don't sacrifice the future on the altar of the immediate. How many of us wish we could go back and undo what we did when we were young people? Because we didn't understand how much of a price it would pay in the future for it. What it did to our lives, what it ruined, what we can never repair because we made the wrong choice. Well, number next, scripture. Just read Matthew 4, 1 through 10 when you go home. Every time Jesus was tempted, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Scripture. Learn scripture. Learn scripture. Scripture is the greatest tool to keep you straight. Scripture is the greatest weapon you have against the devil. When he starts attacking you, you can say, wait a minute. God says, you're a liar, Satan. When you know the truth, you'll recognize a lie and you can call Satan what he is. You're a liar. You're not saved. Yes, I am. I accepted Christ as my Savior. That makes me saved. Well, you're not living right. You can't be saved. The Bible says he'd never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. He gave me eternal life. Amen. You're, he's a liar. You've got worse. You've got to use your scripture. Well, let me go quickly. I've got to finish this because I'm not going to be here next week. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's time to move on. But I want to finish 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me give you another word, the word flee. The word flee. Flee. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. By the way, i got four passages of Scripture we won't read, but just this one. I'll give you the rest of them. You can write them down. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18. Look what it says. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 through 15 talks about no temptation taking you. In verse 14 it says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Write down 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 11. In verse 11 he says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee also youthful lusts. Flee. Flee. Well, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to... No, get out of there. As fast as you can, run as far as you can, don't look back. When temptation is there and you're about to uh, give in to temptation, it's time to turn and run just as hard as you can and as fast as you can. True story. A preacher in a town got a call from a lady in his church. She was in her mid-40s. He, he was in his late 40s. Her husband had recently died. He got this call from this lady. And, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I'm really struggling with my husband's death. She walked over to, he went over to her house. When he walked up to the door, she opened the door in a very, very sensual negligee. He said, preacher, and just, she tried to seduce the preacher. Immediately, as soon as he saw it, he turned and got in his car and he drove just as fast as he could to his office at the church. He did the right thing. He fled. But one of his very good friends on the other side of town who was a pastor received a phone call from him. He said, brother, I need you to come over to my office right now if you can. I need you right now. And so this guy got in his car and drove over to this guy's office, this guy who had ran from this woman who was trying to seduce him. And he walked in and he said, he said, I'm glad you're here. I want to tell you what happened. He told him the story. And that preacher said to him, well, preacher, you did the right thing. You fled. You got away from him. He said, well, why did you call me? He said, because I want you to stay here with me until I no longer want to go back there. Now, be, be really good if every time that you face sin and you did the right things, but sin would leave you alone. But it's not the truth. You may resist it. You may walk away from it. Hallelujah, did the right thing. But your enemy, the devil, and your wicked flesh is still there. And they're still trying to see if they can't get you to fall into it. And I've said this before. It's like the Chinese water torture. 
If it would just have one thought, it'd be okay, but it keeps pounding and keeps pounding and keeps pounding. It's like the waves of the ocean. It hits you and you resist it, and then it hits you again and you resist it. You think, how many more times can I deal with this before it succumbs me? We must stand strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and we must continue daily to fight that battle. That's why God says put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We, flesh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality. The devil is out to get us, and that's how he, it's the only way he can get us is by tempting us and drawing us into sin. And I wish that, I wish that you have a sin in your life tonight, and I wish you could just one time defeat it and it would go away, but that's probably not going to happen. You may have to defeat it and defeat it and defeat it and defeat it and defeat it. And it might take you six months. It might take you a year. It might take you five years. It might take you 15 years. But can I tell you something? If you don't win it, you're going to be a big loser. And whatever it takes to win, it's worth it. I mean, whatever it takes. If you have to lose all your friends, it's worth it. If you have to lose all your family, I'm not talking about your wife and kids. I'm talking about the rest of your family that don't love God. It's worth it. If you, if you have to quit doing everything that you enjoy doing, it's worth it to have victory. It's a matter of how bad you want the victory. See, Paul said, they that run a race run all. But one receive the Christ, run that you may obtain. He said, I don't fight uncertainly. I'm not as one that beats the air. I keep under my body and bring it in subjection. Lest after I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. He says, I am an athlete in my Christian life. And I am not taking any chances. I'm training. I'm building up my muscles. And when I hit that devil, I hit him with a, hit, with a fist that strikes. Because I, I don't want to miss. I don't want to wear out. It's worth it, folks. It's worth it. Do not give in to the devil, the flesh, and the world. Win the victory. When you do fail, God still loves you. Confession brings restoration. If we confess, he's faithful. How many times will he forgive, Brother Houston? As long as you're still living, he'll forgive. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And by the way, he won't condemn or criticize you because we have a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity and says, I want you to come boldly to me so I can help you. You don't have to go to him and say, God, I know, you know. He says, come, I want to help you. Come, come, come to me, and I will help you. I will give you strength. Father, thank you for letting me.